Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'd like to discuss distortion and sound quality. What is reasonable? And so there's a lot of discussion surrounding uh, distortion and the audibility of distortion. And I simply can only correlate back to what I find is uh, very, very good sound quality. And consistently, anything that sounds extremely good always measures uh, with very, very low distortion, in particular intermodulation distortion. And so what I wanted to do was maybe propose a distortion amount that would seem reasonable uh, in, in the quest for good system design. And so in this video, I wanted to set some parameters, make some assumptions, and just see based on the test data, we'll test some different compression drivers and tweeters and just see uh, if we're meeting those targets and if that's actually a reasonable target to try to achieve. So since distortion rises basically in a linear fashion to the overall output level, the first thing that we need to determine is the output SPL that you're looking to achieve and that would be the SPL, the SPL level at the listening position, correct? So if we say that we want maybe 90 dB is our maximum sound, qual sound pressure level that we're looking to achieve at the listening position, then we have to correlate that back to what does that mean in terms of what the individual speakers are outputting and in relation to a one meter distance. And so if we do the math on a nine foot listening distance, assuming only two speakers in the listening room, then that becomes 96 dB output at one meter for each speaker. And so let's set that as a, as a specification and we'll add more uh, requirements to our system design. So we'll say 96 dB and we'll pick say 1%. So 1% distortion is uh, means that your noise floor has to be at least 40 dB below the the um, RMS output level of your of your system, and so when I say RMS, I mean the average output. That doesn't include the transient peaks that are um, in music or any kind of sound. And so let's look at that actually in more detail. So when we're talking about the transient peaks and um, audiophiles usually use the term PRAT as an acronym for pace, rhythm, and timing. Um, but that's a non-technical term. If we want to get technical, then that would actually mean that we're discussing what's called crest factor. And so if we look at various genres of music and various artists and their recording styles, um, we can look at specific examples and using software we can look at the, the, the sound itself and see that there's a certain crest factor that goes beyond what would what's referred to as the RMS level of the of the soundtrack. And so if you look at, for example, Steely Dan's catalog, um, you can see that he actually you know, usually an average of around 12 dB uh, crest factor for his music. That means that there's transient peaks in the soundtrack, such as percussion and the, the plucking of, of strings and guitars that exceed the average level. And so when we're conducting measurements, we're using just a basic sine wave to test our speakers. And so we need to add the crest factor that would be expected for the type of music that we're playing and the recording, and it also involves the mixing and the mastering of the individual soundtracks. Um, and so let's add that just for the sake of argument. Um, we're gonna add 12 dB of crest factor and crest factor just to give you the, the definition it's it's how extreme the peaks are in the waveform and so if a sine wave has a crest factor of only 3 db which we're using for our our test signal and so let's add in 12 um, uh, percussion for example can easily exceed um, 18 uh, db from the rms level so let's add that to our list of requirements and we'll uh, now let's look at an actual distortion measurement and so this, this is a intermodulation distortion test using a one ninth octave multi-tone signal in ARTA. And so there's over 20 sine waves being generated simultaneously. And that's what you see that those, these vertical lines are sine tones being generated in the software and the speaker is being asked to reproduce all of these tones simultaneously. So it's a good uh, test at flushing out the differences between drivers and uh, it's a good kind of litmus test uh, that really brings out the weaknesses in drivers and and 
this is very representative of what music looks like with all of the various harmonics. Uh, music is a very challenging uh, medium to reproduce by a speaker. And so what we see with a regular one inch compression driver, this would be a small format driver. We can see that at uh, 95 dB SPL, which is basically the output level that we're looking to achieve, um, you can see that the noise floor is 58 dB down. And so the noise floor is defined by this dark area. These are noise artifacts that are in between the fundamental tones being generated. And so um, did we achieve our 1% target? Well, 1% um, is minus 40 dB, and so we actually have 18 dB of headroom. So did we achieve the performance target? Did we exceed it? Well, not so fast. Let's look at the crust factor. Like we discussed earlier, we have to take into account the transient peaks that are in music. So how do we measure transients when our test signal is just a sine wave? Well, we can simulate the transient peaks by simply increasing the output level and seeing how the driver responds. And so what I've done is I've increased the test SPL from 95 dB up to 105. And what we see here is that the noise floor is reduced by that same 10 dB. So it's been my observation in all the testing where when you do a multi-tone test like this, distortion rises in a linear fashion to output level. And so if, if you raise the SPL by 5 dB, you're gonna lose 5 dB in dynamic range, which is the RMS level of your test signal versus the noise floor. So it's the difference between the two, which is what I'm showing here in the red. So where do we go from here? Well, we can see that by adding the crest factor, we're very close to our original performance metric of 1% distortion. And so you can see here that you can see basically what I would refer to as the noise profile of the compression driver. As we increase uh, in frequency, we can see that the, the noise is, is on a trend, upward trend. So this actually is just a bit of a side tangent to the discussion. Um, I think you guys would find it uh, very interesting. I did another test of a larger compression driver that uses a three inch voice coil and diaphragm and using the same output SPL of 105 dB we can see um, sorry I'm just, this is just showing the the general trend um, there for the noise floor. Now when I tested the larger format compression driver, you can see that while it reproduced the mid-range frequencies with ease, it actually struggled in the upper treble and it actually performed less well as the smaller compression driver. And so we only had 40 dB of, of noise floor. And so um, it's just at the performance threshold that we're, we're establishing. So you can really see the characteristics and it may suggest, you know, particular bandwidth limitations of the compression driver that you're trying to use. If we look at, for example, um, a one inch dome tweeter that's been horn loaded, you can see that it also produces a distortion profile and it has very similar distortion levels as a uh, the, the small format compression driver but you can see here that there's quite a bit of uh, additional noise being introduced in the 5 kilohertz region uh, compared to a compression driver and when we think about uh, so far I've only been discussing mid-range and treble frequencies if we look at bass frequencies we can conduct the same test uh, it's been my experience that the uh, dynamic transducers such as just with a regular cone woofer uh, has um, a lot more difficulty producing the same low distortion levels that you see with mid-range and treble and you can see here this is a um, 12 inch Aton woofer playing um, 95 dB SPL and you can see here that the noise floor is clearly uh, at 40 dB uh, below the, the fundamental tones. And so 40 dB is 1%. And so you can see that that's uh, a very pretty strong case that it's producing clean output up to 95 dB. Um, so this uh, pretty much concludes my video. So I just wanted to highlight again that uh, distortion is, is one factor that you should consider uh, when doing a system design because if you don't uh, 
observe and and look at this, then you may end up with a system that produces uh, too much distortion at the the listening level. And so, a, a, a driver that's been stressed with uh, distortion will sound fatiguing and harsh and lack in dynamics. And so, on the topic of this, uh, we can we can just discover that the overall SPL level at the listening position is a factor and the listing distance, the room size, as well as other factors such as, which we didn't discuss here, but the room boundary effects and whether your listening room is open to adjacent rooms or if it's enclosed. The musical genre, typical, generally speaking, musical genre has um, different crest factors uh, along, as long with the uh, mixing and mastering uh, process and with dynamic compression um, that that definitely has an effect on on the the crest factor of the soundtrack um, and so the uh, and along with the topic is setting a, an acceptable level of distortion ie one uh, percent so this concludes my video and I hope you found it interesting take care and have a great day